Good evening. It's nice to be with you again, isn't it, Ronnie? Yes, isn't it? Now, on the show tonight, we've got several musical items, including the string quartet of the British Twine Association, the, uh, the mast pipes of the Scottish tobacconists, and the elastic band of the stationery office. But first, the news. The Department of Environment announced that a new electric car is to be withdrawn from the market. A spokesman said it was a failure, it could only travel three yards as the flex wasn't long enough. <laughs> and here's some traffic news. The M6 was promoted to M7 today. <laughs> Motorists advised to continue as usual, but salute. <laughs> And the Ministry of Transport announced a new roundabout on the A1. It's 10p a go, three minutes a ride, and bring the children. <laughs> and here is a warning for drivers in the Midlands. The police apologise for the fact that due to repairs, all detours are closed. Motorists will have to use the alternative route, the M1. <laughs> Thieves in a stolen car were apprehended today after a 100 mile per hour chase by Police Constable Wainwright, who followed them on foot. <laughs> Said PC Wainwright, I had no choice. They shut the door on my truncheon. <laughs> and now... And now here's news of a record. Or another record. The biggest collection of matchboxes stuffed with sage and onion ever to cross the Severn Estuary in the largest barge ever powered by a clockwork engine designed by the tallest bald man in Worcestershire <laughs> was sunk today... <laughs> by the third largest brick ever thrown from Western Superman. <laughs> a man, a man appeared at Bow Street today, charged with dangerous driving. His car got out of control in a winding country lane and narrowly missed a very thin pig. He told the court it was a narrow squeak. <laughs> and finally, some racing news. At Kempton Park today, the starters in the 2.30 were minestrone soup and grapefruit cocktail. Prunes were withdrawn at the last moment. <laughs> Only three ran. <laughs> now, and now it's time for a sketch. In this sketch, you will, of course, see Ronnie Corbett, whose fan club yesterday gave him a huge ovation and a small pair of trousers. <laughs> And you'll also see Ronnie Barker, whose fan club yesterday gave him a huge pair of trousers and a small ovation. <laughs> few moments of tranquility, ghosts of yesteryear and that sort of thing. I must, I must be honest when I say that I find these uh, old boys reunions uh, <coughs> terribly moving. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, sorry, it's all right. I'm sorry, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to blub. It's all right, it's all right. I tell you what, I, as a matter of fact, I, I came in here for, this, for the very same reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's silly, really, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, listen, your, your face is, is awfully familiar. Don't tell me. Uh, yeah. Scaife, Elliot House, 4349. Scaife, of course. But you were taller then. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well. Oh, lofty Scaife. <laughs> and you were, uh, you well, were... I was here behind you, Banyard. Good God, yes, Barnyard. No, 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 no. Barnyard. I mean, Banyard. <laughs> I know, but everyone used to call you Barnyard. Yes, they don't anymore. <laughs> now, wait a minute. There was, uh, there was you, yes. me, and uh, who was that? Who was that other little girl? Um, Pringle, Arthur Pringle. Arthur Pringle. Yes. <laughs> Proper little sneak, wasn't he? Yes, he was. <laughs> he was, really. I often, be honest with you, I often thought he was a little girl. Yes. Yes. <laughs> he did have a chitty in Jim to keep his vest on, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me, whose fag was he? Oh, anybody's. Anybody's. <laughs> Mind you, he was a damn good cricketer. Damn yes, I'll give the band a credit. Yes, he was the, uh, the school's first homosexual wicketkeeper. <laughs> he got his colours. Chose them himself. Mm. <laughs> Cerise and Violet. Yes. <laughs> ah, there he is. Ah, I wonder, 
wonder where he is now. Well, in Denmark, according to the Sunday Mirror. <laughs> Nothing, nothing like that about you there, was there? What? <laughs> you were a proper little beggar with the girls, if I remember correctly. Well, I did build up a slight reputation, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, whatever happened to that friend of your sister's, Joanna? That, that girl who used to come to open days with your sister? Um, horse of the Year, we used to call her. <laughs> <laughs> you remember? A great toothy thing with thighs like an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, whatever happened to her? I married her. <laughs> I shouldn't have said anything like that. I'm sorry, I'm awfully sorry. But you know what girls are like in their teens. I expect, I expect she's, she's blossomed into an absolutely beautiful young lady. No, 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 got very much worse, if anything. <laughs> <laughs> Rapidly downhill, I finally divorced her. Oh dear, on what grounds, might I ask? Well, on the grounds that she was trampling me to death elsewhere. <laughs> the general public do seem impressed with a, with a public school education. I can't, can't pretend it hasn't helped. No, you've done well, have you? I have done well. I have done well. Oh. I've done well. Well, well. Yes. In fact, I've done extremely well. As well as you would expect it? Oh, oh, yes, well. I mean better. <laughs> yes, fate, fate has been terribly kind to us, really, because when one thinks back, really, we were a couple of shockers. Oh, a couple of absolute cads, weren't we? <laughs> no essential moral fibre. Yeah. As Matron said when she caught me with my hand up her apron, you're a very naughty, wicked, rude boy, and I want to see you in my room at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> a shocking pair. Yes, they were, but our legs weren't there. I quite <laughs> No, no, I mean us, I mean us. Oh, you mean us, yes. I mean us, yes. I mean, now, of course, everything seems, doesn't it not, shrouded in the mist of nostalgia. I'd almost really forgotten Pringle, you know. Have you really? Yes. yes. If only, if only one could make amends. Indeed. Give something back, a yes. small donation, you know, not too much, nothing too ostentatious. No. I know. What about the Scaife Banyard Memorial Prize for Grit? What about uh, that? It could stand there in the middle of all the other trophies. <laughs> Just a minute. Where are all the other trophies? What? <laughs> what can I say? What can I say, Banyard? And for you of all people to find out. Yes, I stole them. I came here to steal them. And when you came in, I was on my way to the headmaster's study to take the rowing cups. They're not there anymore. <laughs> Do you mean they're... they're in there? Every one of them. <laughs> Same old banyard. Same old scape. <laughs> well, will you be coming down here next year? Though? Oh, why not? One always gets something out of it. This <laughs> one is not enough for three. <laughs> About fifteen hundred of the wind 
Here is the news. <clears throat> and now the rest of the news. Well, uh, it's still raining. And, uh, and the 8.33 from Watford arrived eight minutes late this morning and there was a woman in an absurd pink hat on the train. And it was raining at the bus stop. At 149 Boddington Road, Harrow this morning, it was announced that unless something was done about the back boiler, there was going to be trouble. <laughs> Later, a man was understood to be helping his wife with the washing up. <laughs> Uh, my left hand is slightly larger than my right hand. <laughs> it was stated in London today. Ah, ah uh, here is a late news flash. Pull yourself together, man, and tell them something. <clears throat> uh, Auntie Clara and Uncle Bob are well. <laughs> and send their love. They've had two fine days, and Bimby and the twins are loving it, and they'll close now, hoping to see you on Saturday. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, oh, it, was, it was announced today that Edwin Klump has the best terms for light removal and odd jobs, and he further stated that he would uh, go anywhere uh, and, uh, and, in fact, uh, do anything. Uh, we hope to have some film of that in our next bulletin. <laughs> Later today, uh, later today, Her Majesty the Queen uh, promised to pay the bearer on demand uh, the sum of one pound. Um, uh, um, the average contents of a box of matches is 36. And, uh, officer, inspecting food, what is this? Sergeant, it's bean soup, sir. Officer, I don't care what it's bean, what is it now? <laughs> Joke number 76, copyright made in Sweden. H.B. Ever Sharp. <laughs> Jenny, 246-8049. Easy. <laughs> Robert Dougal Loves Dusty Springfield, 1967. <laughs> Inglenook, Watchmakers. One, two, three, four, five, dot. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, dot. And if any of you have got any news items that you'd like to hear, send them in to me, please. Care of the BBC. And please hurry. Oh, thanks. And now I've got the sack. <laughs> latest disaster to hit Brimston Grange, scene of many a gory tragedy in the past week, was the mass murder of the gardeners buried in their own vegetable patch. The spectacle was too much for the hot-blooded but highly strung Blanche. She collapsed onto the ground in a dead faint. Charlie Farley stood by helplessly, but his overweight boss, Piggy Malone, knew there was only one thing to do, carry her back to the house as quickly as possible.
Three hours later, they were still no nearer to solving the mystery. Malone had suggested that they all relax and make their minds a blank. And in this, they had found the beautifully built Blanche more than cooperative. Whose turn is it? I think it's Malone's. But he's asleep. Are you sure? Well, nobody snores like that when they're awake. Then it's your turn again, if you like. Would you like? I don't mind, if you think it helps. Yes, I think it does. Fine. Okay. I spy with mine and life. <laughs> Otter. That begins with O. No, these begin with T. <laughs> Must be Otter, the murderer. What makes you say that? Well, look, Charlie, it's only him left and Pike the butler. Well, what about Billy Brimstone and his brand new blushing bride, Brenda? They're still alive and kicking. How do you know? Well, they're in the room next door to mine. And that's my point. Was it? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean No, that. I mean, that's exactly what I mean. Otto is insanely jealous of Billy. He's always been in love with Brenda. Everybody knows that. Well, I didn't. I mean, everybody who is anybody. Oh, dear. I think we should keep a very close eye on Herr Otto Van Dancer. Remember, he's a crack shot. Suddenly, a young couple hove into view and almost immediately began to heave out again. Otto's eyes narrowed and his nostrils widened. It was Billy Brimson and his brand new blushing bride, Brenda. In the few short weeks since Otto had first met the happy couple, he had become the victim of a strange love-hate relationship. He loved her and he hated him. And so it was that on that bright afternoon, a strange game of chess was to play itself out and the overweight detective and his fearful assistant, Charlie, were to find themselves mere pawns in a deadly battle for survival.
Discovered my guilty secret. <laughs> I am taking your lovely bride with me. Should you attempt to follow, you will die. You, you German pig. You speak of me, I demand satisfaction. <laughs> we will settle this once and for all. Follow me, I pleasure. And so Otto Van Dancer, a recognized crack shot, was to fight a duel with young Billy Brimston, a man whose inaccuracy was well known. Even at his London club, he had never once got his umbrella into the stand at the first attempt. <laughs> killed each other or was that strange notice board merely a part of the killer's fiendish sense of humor and what was Blanche doing in the woods had she gone there simply to pick her nosegay <laughs> alone intended to find out one thing was certain there would be very little sleep for anyone that night
Lovely voice, wasn't it? Lovely. I hope you're going to, uh, <coughs> talking about voices, excuse my voice this evening because uh, I've got a little bit of a cold. Can't seem to shake it off. I've had it since I was 11. <laughs> now, don't say, please don't say, have you tried penicillin? Because I've had so much penicillin that every time I sneeze, I cure somebody. <laughs> now, they even sent me, they even sent me to the studio doctor to see the studio doctor before the show. So I went along to the surgery, the surgery, a weighing machine and an eye bath. <laughs> you can hardly, hardly call it a surgery, really. Now, he had a look at me, asked me if I'd lost weight or got anything in my eye, and told me to have faith. Now, I, I, go, I go in there for a head cold, and all he told me was that I haven't got a hernia. <laughs> now, he took so many blood samples, I think he must have been keeping an anemic friend. <laughs> you see, the trouble with the BBC is, the trouble is that they won't pay these people. I mean, it's pitiful. I mean, the only time this fellow has a meal is when there's food poisoning in the canteen and they send somebody over for analysis. <laughs> I mean, you've no idea what goes on. Well, things are much better now than they used to be. I mean, the old chap before him, he used to live on wild berries and what he could catch in the shrubbery outside the studio. <laughs> A late spring in 1969, he was gone. I remember it was 1969 because, uh, because 1969 was a very unlucky year. That was the year that my uncle Mildred, <laughs> the one who had the accident in the sawmill, <laughs> he, became the f he became the first person to slide down Everest on a tin tray. <laughs> and we buried him where he came to rest. <laughs> Just outside Watford. <laughs> which, which reminds me, which reminds me of a very funny story about an artist from Watford, which is a bit of luck because it does take our mind off Uncle Mildred. My God, he must have been going in a hell of a lick. <laughs> anyway, this artist, this artist meets this girl, you see, and she said to him, will you paint me in the nude? And he said, well, actually, I don't suppose but for a minute she, she came out with it just like that, you know. I mean, when I took up art, I mean, I had a devil of a job getting a nude to model for me. Ten pounds an hour. Take it or leave it. No five bob for a quick look and run all the way home and do it for a <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, the most, the most important lesson I learned now is this. When drawing the nude female model, you must be completely detached. You shouldn't even speak. Now, this is where I made my first mistake. She took off her clothes, and I said, I love you. <laughs> it, was a, it was a careless remark and a promis promising career in ruins. Luckily, I hadn't spent a lot of money on equipment. All I had up to then was a buyer and an empty cornflake packet, <laughs> which, which the magistrate ordered to be destroyed for my own good. <laughs> That, that was all a long time ago, that, although I sometimes, I sometimes do think of taking up painting, you know, now that I can do the thing properly. I've got plenty of brushes, paint, an easel, my own studio, and a damn good solicitor. <laughs> anyway, the artist and the girl joke. Actually, this joke is, is a little bit strong. It's the joke they said could not be told. What can they do to me? I can always work in the railways, can't I? The trouble, that's the trouble these days. There's not enough people with the courage of their own convictions. And I happen to be one of them. So... <laughs> So there's these two Irishmen, you see. <laughs> Who wants to work for the railways? There's these two Irishmen, you see. Their, their names were Pat and Mike, you see. Now, one day, Pat said to Mike, why don't we go, a rather posh Irishman, actually, why don't we go, he said, why don't we go and hire a boat and go fishing? Right, said Mike, who wasn't quite so posh. <laughs> right, right, he said. Right, he said which is exactly what they do. They went off, you see, fishing in this boat, caught lots and lots of fish, and Pat said to Mike, that's the posh one, Faith and Bigora, he said. Faith and Bigora, said the posh Pat. This is a very fine place for fishing. Why don't we come and fish this very spot tomorrow? Well, Mike said, who was the less posh one, said, but how are we to know where to find the spot? He was the less posh one, you see. How are we to know where to... Well, Mike said, this is very easy, he said. We make a mark on the side of the boat. <laughs> Pat said, that's ridiculous, we might not get the same boat. Now... <laughs> 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 
Yeah, that's the one, yes. <laughs> Exciting news for all those who love the romantic, exhilarating rhythm of the Viennese waltz. A Vienna music publisher has just unearthed a long-lost operetta based on Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, with music by the waltz king, Johann Strauss. Caesar is real, soon he'll be home, back in Good people, for your welcome here. The wars have kept me from you for a year, but all this time I've longed and yearned and sighed for beautiful Calpurnia, my sweet bride. She's waiting still, as luscious as a plum. And so, folks, Calpurnia, here I come. <laughs> oh, no, no, Caesar. Good Mark Antony, thine ample form is welcome to my sight. It seems so long. Aye, and much wider, too. <laughs> Thou hast put on a bit of weight around the forum since I saw thee last. It is true. I eat too much Italian food. Cut the spaghetti, my physician says, but that just makes it easier to eat. <laughs> I love thy newfound girth. It merely means you're now a bigger friend than once you were. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike to Cassius, who just sidled in. He usurps my power and he is thin. He craves my crown, he craves my land, my life. A man's a proper craver. So is his wife. <laughs> Good citizens of Rome, hear Caesar's words. Let me have men about me that are fat. Yon Cassius has a hungry look, a lean and mean and hungry look. And he thinks too much, and he drinks too much, and he whispers and he winks too much. Yon Cassius has a hungry look, a lean and mean. I had forgot the Ides of March are here. I have a message for thy secret ear. Oh, hearken to me, Caesar. I insist. All right, don't get thy toga in a twist. <laughs> Make your good nights. The day draws to a close. It's just as well, they're nosy so and so's. Mm. I met a soothsayer once when but a youth. What did this soothsayer say? He said a sooth. <laughs> beware, beware, beware the Ides of March. Take care, take care. Oh, no, take care. Beware, or neath this very arch, I prophesy you'll die, 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 die. I've never heard such a lot of rot. Lot of what? Lot of rot. Now go and buy me an apricot. Very well, Caesar, tata. Look who's coming, good old Brutus. Hello, Caesar. Hello, Brutus. Why, for do you not salute us? Because you are a pig. When you speak, men turn pale. Lift that barge, took that veil. Well, you're through now. That's your cue now. Take that and that, you wicked little work. Take that and that. Hey! And you, do you, your faithful friend betray. Before I do, I would simply like to say, sell your pay. Caesar, I have brought the apricot. All right, lads. Great! Oh. oh, mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Anoint great Caesar's bony knees with tears. Although he was not handsome, strong, or tall, this was the nobliest Roman of them all. <laughs> but see, a sign, a portent far from good. The river Tiber doth run red. 
Where's Blood? Yes, the Tiber's rig. It's red, so red. For Caesar hath bled. He's bled, he's bled. Yes, Caesar is dead. He's dead, he's dead. His killers have fled. They fled, they fled. And tears must be shed. Be shed, be shed. By Tom, Nick, and Fred. Tom, Dick, and Fred. <laughs> Our hearts are like lead. Just like lead. What's that head? We dread, we dread. But we'll have no more of this. In heaven's name. Great Caesar, many daggers rent thy frame, and yet with a, with all the art alive. How so? Because it is not yet the Ronnie Barker show. Oh. <laughs> a happy ending was decreed by Strauss, so I live on to play the second house. I'll pardon every Roman, true or false. Oh, thanks, Great Caesar. May I have this waltz? <laughs> You stood by faithfully, and so, good Mark, won't you come along with me? Where are we going? To the courthouse, shorthouse? No, to the palazzo, fatso. <laughs> Hooray! What this? Now can you back the gent? We'll say, say this, which is that for the end. Well, that's all for this week. Um, next week, an enterprising farmer in Herefordshire will tell you how he's training animals to do his office work for him. So far, he's produced a pig that grunts into a dictaphone, a horse that carries a cup of coffee in its mouth, and a sheep that sits on the boss's lap and makes sheep's eyes at him. <laughs> but he's had no success at all with his herd of short-horn typists. <laughs> And we'll be, uh, we'll be telling you about a new BBC programme dealing with the problems of the oversexed. This programme will be shown 14 times a week. <laughs> I shall watch it three or four times myself. <laughs> the teeth of a prehistoric mammoth were found today in Sussex. This is a double event, according to the man who found them, Professor Smithers. Not only are they the world's oldest teeth, but they were in the world's biggest glass of water. <laughs> And a British pharmacologist from Cambridge made a remarkable breakthrough in medicine today when he mixed a packet of aspirins with a bottle of glue and discovered the cure for the splitting headache. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's good night from me. And it's good night from him. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.